Ron Paul, the insurgent, a powerful force in the first contests with an army of young voters. We are dangerous to the status quo in this country. Texas Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you very much. It's great to be here tonight. Uh, I'm a congressman from Texas. I've been elected for 12 uh, times, and also I practiced OBGYN for a 30-year period. I've also served uh, five years in the military, and I'm, only, I'm the only uh, U.S. veteran on this stage tonight. I think too often all of us are on the receiving ends of attacks from the media. It's very disturbing because sometimes they're not based on facts and we suffer the consequences. You know, sometimes it reminds me of this uh, idea of getting corporations out of running campaigns. But what about the corporations that run the media? I mean, they're always in charge. <laughs> I think our responsibility uh, since sorting facts and fiction, the people have to sort this out. But I think setting standards are very important, and I'm very proud that my wife of 54 years is with me tonight. We're in a state with 9.9% unemployment. And Jane asked this question. List three or more specific programs that will put American people back to work. Congressman Paul, I want to begin with you. Do you believe we need specific federal programs to put the American people back to work? Well, most of the things the federal government could do to get us back to work is get out of the way. I'd like to name. I'd like to see the uh, federal government have a sound currency. That creates a healthy economy. I, I would like to uh, see massive reduction of uh, regulations. I would like to see income tax reduced as, to near zero as, as possible. And that is what we have to do. We have to get the government out of the way. We have to recognize why we have unemployment. And it comes because we have a deeply flawed financial system that causes financial bubbles. The bubbles burst and you have the unemployment. Now, the most important thing to get over that hump that was created artificially by bad economic policies is to allow the correction to occur. You have to get rid of the excessive debt. You have to get rid of the malinvestment. And you don't do that by buying the debt off, off the people who, who were benefiting from it. So we, the people, shouldn't be stuffed with, stuck with these debts on these mortgage derivatives and all. We need to get that behind us, which means the government shouldn't be doing any bailout. So most of the things to improve the environment is getting the government out of the way and enforce contract laws and enforce bankruptcy laws. Let, let, let's stay on the economy and let's stay on the South Carolina experience all you gentlemen have had. As you know and as this audience reflects, this is a state incredibly proud of its military tradition and incredibly proud of its veterans. Many of those veterans who have served post 9-11, served honorably in Iraq and Afghanistan, are coming back to a terrible economy. Right now, unemployment rate for post 9-11 veterans aged 18 to 24 is at 22 percent. Congressman Paul, to you first, sir. Should the federal government be specifically targeting that part? Are veterans coming back saying the unemployment rate is so high among that subgroup that the federal government should offer a tax incentive to employers or take other steps to help them, to incentivize the economy, to help them get jobs? Uh, to, to some degree, but you really want to make the environment, the economy healthy for everybody and not designate special places. But, but to help them out to come back is, is probably necessary on some occasions now. But we have to think about how serious our problems are here because we faced something much, much greater after World War II. We had 10 million came home all at once. We, but what, what did we do then? There were some of the liberals back then that said, oh, we have to have more work programs and do this and that. And they thought they would have to, you know, do everything conceivable for those 10 million. They never got around to it because they came home so quickly. But you know what the government did? They cut the budget by 60 percent. They cut taxes by 30 percent. By that time, the debt had been liquidated. And everybody went back to work again that you didn't need any special programs. So but the one thing, t talking about concern about the, uh, the military and the veterans, I'm very proud that, uh, you know, I get 
twice as many donations from the uh, military, active military people, than all the rest uh, put together. So I am very concerned about them. I think where the real problem is, is uh, we can create a healthy economic environment if we did the right things. But where the veterans really deserve help, both as a physician and as a congressman, is the people who come back and aren't doing well health-wise. They need a lot more help. We have an epidemic now of suicide of our military coming back. So they need a lot of medical help. And uh, I think they come up short change. They came up short change after Vietnam War, Persian Gulf War, and even now. They don't get care from the Veterans Administration. I think we all agree. Let's turn now and take a question from down in our audience tonight. Go ahead, sir. My name is Sonny Cohn. I'm from Sevier County, Tennessee. My question to any of the candidates is, do, do any of you sincerely believe that Obamacare can either be repealed or reversed in its entirety? Congressman Paul, you have the floor. Do you trust these men to uh, repeal Obamacare? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, thought you were, I thought maybe you were prejudiced against doctors and a doctor that practiced medicine in the military or something. No, the, the, I want to address the question. The, the gentleman asked whether he thinks we can repeal Obamacare. Theoretically, we can. The likelihood isn't all that good. We can diminish some of the effect. But I'm more concerned about a bigger picture of what's happening, and that is government involvement in medicine. I, I, I had the privilege of practicing medicine in the early 60s before we had any government. And it worked rather well, and there was nobody out in the street suffering with no medical care. But Medicare and Medicaid came in, and, uh, and, and, and it just expanded. But even when we had the chance to cut back on it, when we had a Republican Congress and a Republican president, we, we gave him prescription drug programs. Senator Santorum supported it. You know, that's expanding the government. So, so it's endless. And, and, the, and, and most of them are bankrupt. Prescription drugs, they, they, they're not going to be financed. Medicare is not financeable. Medicaid's in trouble. But nobody talks about where the money's going to come from. Now, even in my budget proposal, which is very, very tough because I'm going to cut a trillion dollars the first year, but I try to really... Even though these programs should have never started, but a lot of people are dependent on, I want to try to protect uh, the, the people who are dependent on, on medical care. Now, where does the money come? My suggestion is look at some of the overseas spending that we don't need to be doing. We have, we have troops in Korea since, world, and since the Korean War, in Japan since World War II, in Germany since World War II. Those are subsidies to these countries. And we keep fighting these wars that don't need to be fought. They're undeclared. They never end. Newt pointed out, you know, World War II was won in less than four years. Afghanistan were there for 10 years. Nobody says, where's the money come? We could work our way out of here and take care of these people on, on with these medical needs, but we can't do it with the current philosophy of the government taking care of everybody forever on medical care, cradle to grave, and being the policeman of the world. We will get rid of all this government program, unfortunately, because we're going bankrupt and you're going to have runaway inflation, and our checks are going to bounce, and that's going to be a lot worse problem than we're facing tonight. Uh, John Marcoux from the great city of Charleston. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, when will you release your tax return specifically? Congressman Paul, I want to start with you. We reached out to your campaign this week, and they said you would not release your tax returns. Why? Well, well hadn't thought it, thought it through. I don't have an intention of doing it, but for a different reason. I'd probably be embarrassed to put my financial <laughs> statement up against their income, and I don't want to be embarrassed because I don't have a greater income. <laughs> now, um, I mean, it may come to that, but uh, right now I have no intention of doing that. I think with our financial statements, congressional financial statements, I think you know more about me than I know about myself. That's how my wife found out so much about what we were doing, you know, from my financial state. Now, we don't need, I don't think people need that uh, because nobody's challenging me because I have no conflict of interest and I don't even talk to lobbyists and, uh, and I don't take that kind of money. So there's no conflict. But, Congressman Paul, how do you revive Made in America? You have to create the right conditions to bring these uh, companies back, and they have to bring their capital back, and it shouldn't be taxed. But Apple's a great company, but the way you ask the question, it infers that because 
There's a bunch of workers overseas that hasn't benefited a lot of people here. The consumers obviously have been benefited by a good company well run. But obviously there's a lot of employees with Apple in this country as well. I don't think that's the number that you have to be concerned about. A lot of people worry about us buying and money going overseas. But if you send money to China, they say they're paying wages over there and pay, we send dollars over there. Well, they don't put it, the dollars in a shoebox. They have to spend those dollars. Unfortunately, they're buying our debt and perpetuating our consumerism here and our debt here. But immediately there's a benefit to us because those dollars come back. But also when you get products, if they're buying products cheaper over there, uh, they, let's say the computer cost $100 instead of $1,000. Well, the person's just saved $900. That helps the economy. That $900 stays in that person's pocket. So whether it's shoes or a computer, so we shouldn't be frightened about trade or sending money on, but we have to look at the reason why they're doing this. I mean, even the car companies, there's obviously a problem with car companies here. They're in bigger trouble. We had to bail them out. But there are foreign companies that build cars in this country and they make a living out of it. So it's, it's more complex than that, but we have to do whatever we can. I think the, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the union problem, the uh, right to work states, and uh, of course I've chided uh, Senator Santorum on this because he has voted, you know, against right to work. But we have to change these conditions to invite people back. But believe me, the regulations and the fact that we are the issuer of the reserve currency of the world is a real bl a temporary blessing for us because it's easy for us to export our money. That's our, unfortunately our greatest export and they're still taking our money. Soon though they're going to quit and this whole ball game is going to end and we better get prepared for it. Let's... What is your take on SOPA and how do you believe it affects Americans? For those who have not been following that SOPA is the Stop Online Piracy Act. Crack down on internet piracy, which is clearly a problem, but opponents say it's censorship. Full disclosure, our parent company, Time Warner, says we need a law like this because some of its products, movies, programmings, and the like, are being ripped off online. I was the first Republican to sign on with a, a host of Democrats to oppose this law. And we have worked... We have had a concerted effort, and I feel like we're making achievement there. This bill is not going to pass, but watch out for the next one. And I am pleased that the attitude is sort of mellowed up here because the Republicans, unfortunately, have been on the wrong side of this issue. And this is a good example on why it's good to have somebody that can look at civil liberties and work with coalitions and bring people together. Freedom and the Constitution bring factions together. I think this is a good example. After months and months of campaigning, if you could do one thing over, what would it be? I, I can't think of any one thing that I would do differently, but I would continue to do what I'm always trying to do. One thing that I believe uh, about a free society is it provides the opportunity for us to work for our own virtue and excellence. And in campaigning, I think I can still learn a lot about becoming a better uh, deliverer of a message. And uh, the conviction I have, but I think if I spoke a little slower and made more conviction, <laughs> that I could do a better job. So I think in general, I, could, uh, I, I will continue to work on delivering a message, which I think is a great message. All right, gentlemen, thank you. Let's get back to our issues discussion, and let's begin with a question down in our audience. Hi, I would like to ask on the issue of amnesty of the illegal aliens, uh, would you, how would you secure that the American citizens would get, keep the jobs in line first for them? You've heard your colleagues talk about and making sure employers, companies that hire large numbers of people, making sure they get the message. They can't hire illegals. What about individuals? About a quarter of the illegal immigrants in the country work for individuals. If this is a problem, if I hired an illegal immigrant, say, to clean my home, should I be prosecuted for doing that? I don't believe you should be because I think those laws are misdirected. That makes you the policeman or the businessman the policeman or the Catholic Church the policeman if they do anything to help an illegal immigrant. It should be the law enforcers, and that is the border guards and the federal governments in charge of immigration. So, no, I don't, I don't agree with those laws, but that doesn't mean that I'm soft in the issue of illegal immigration. I illegal, I can't imagine anybody standing up here and saying, oh, I'm for illegal immigration. We're all against illegal immigration. But I think what we fail to do is, is, is look at the incentives. And it has a lot to do with economics. There's an economic incentive for them to come, uh, for, 
for immigrants to come. But there's also an incentive for some of our people in this country not to take a job that's a low paying job. You're not supposed to say that, but that is true. But there's also an economic incentive in the welfare state for immigrants to come in. In Texas, we suffer from the fact that there are federal mandates that we have to take care of their medical needs and their educational needs. And it bankrupts some of our, our school districts and uh, our hospitals. So it's those mandates. But we need a more generous immigration policy. It should be legal, but we need more resources. But I, I find that the resources are all overseas. I would, when, it, when I was in the military, I was on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. And that is a no man's land. You can't see the border. At least we can, we can see the river south of Texas. We know the, where the Rio Grande is. Over there, we can't see it. But we're over there fighting and dying over that border, looking for problems. Why don't we take those resources and quit pretending we can defend those borders and put them on our borders and take care of our needs here. All right, let's move on. Let's take another question. Congressman, I'll bring you in on this one. Let's, let's take a question now from social media. Question. Before we move on, you want in on this issue? They want you in on this issue. Would you like in on this issue? But John, once again, it's a medical subject, and I'm a doctor, you know. <laughs> no, I, I do want to make a couple comments, because I can remember the very early years studying obstetrics, and I was told, and it was before the age of abortion, and I was told, taking care of a woman that's pregnant, you have two patients. And I think that's, that solves a lot of the problem about, you know, when life begins and all. But I also experienced a time uh, later on in my training in the 1960s when the culture was changing. The Vietnam War was going on, the drugs were there, and pornography came in, and abortion became prevalent even though it was illegal. So the morality of the country changed, but then the law followed up. When the morality changed, it will reflect on the laws. The, the law is very important. We should have these laws, but law will not correct the basic problem, and that's the morality uh, of the people that we must do. Now, just very, very briefly, I want to talk a little bit about that funding, because the, the flaw there is if you, if you send funding out and you say, well, you can have it for birth control, but not for abortion, all funds are fungible. Even funds that go to any hospital, if you say, well, it's not for uh, birth control and it's not for Planned Parenthood, it's not for abortion, if you send it to the hospital, they can still use that money. This is an indictment of government-run medicine because you never can sort that all out. You need the government out of that business or you will always argue over who's paying what bills. Right, very quickly, Senator. I think that, that was directed at me, and so I, I would just say this. Uh, Congressman Paul has a national right to life voting record of 50% which is pretty much what Harry Reid's national right to life voting record is. So for, uh, to, to go out and say that you know, you're someone who stands up for the right to life, you repeatedly vote against bills on a federal level to promote the right to life, and you, you say that this is an individual personal decision or state decision, life should be protected and you should have the willingness to stand up on a federal level on any level of government and protect what our, constitu excuse me, what our declaration protects, which is the right of our creator to life, and that is a federal issue, not a state issue. Quickly, sir. Well, just, just for the record, I wasn't even thinking about you when I was giving my statement, so you are overly sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> But, it, but okay. it is true that we have a disagreement on how we approach it. I follow what my understanding is of the Constitution, and it, it does allow for the states to deal with difficult problems. Matter of fact, it allows the states to deal with almost all the problems if you look at it. It is not given, these powers aren't given to the Congress. I see abortion as a violent act. All other violence is handled by the states. Murder, burglary, violence, that's a state issue. So. Don't try to say that I'm less pro-life because I want to be particular about the way we do it and allow the states the prerogative. 
this is the solution. This is the solution because if we would allow the states to write their laws, take away the jurisdiction by a majority vote in the Congress, you repeal Roe versus Wade overnight instead of waiting year after year to change the court system. We're inside 35 hours now from voters in South Carolina going to the polls. And we all know the history of this state. In modern times, the winner of the South Carolina Republican primary has gone on to be your party's nominee. We have an interesting race at the moment. Senator Santorum wins Iowa. Governor Romney wins New Hampshire. Everybody's waiting to see. Most people believe if Governor Romney wins here, he would be the prohibitive favorite. I want each of you, since we have a short time left, and I'll start on the end, we'll come down the line. Congressman Paul, make your case. Make your case. South Carolina essentially faces this decision. Not so fast. Let's continue the race or embrace Governor Romney. Make your case to the people of South Carolina in these final hours. Well, South Carolina is known for their uh, respect for liberty. And a lot of people will ask the question... They will ask the question, oh, hey, what will you do for South Carolina or what will you do for New Hampshire? What will you do for the various states? But if you understand liberty, it's equal for everybody. It benefits everybody. So if you have uh, a protection of liberty, which is the purpose of the Constitution, protection individual liberty, and that means you protect the private property uh, rights system. And if you do that, that benefits everybody. And this is what we have to do, is convince people that we can bring people together with the understanding of what those, those beliefs were that made America great. And it, it is freedom. It isn't this continued spending money and debt. This is the reason we're in a mountain of debt and we have to deal with it. We really never even got around to talking about that tonight. And one of my very modest proposals... My modest proposal is in the one first year, cut a trillion dollars out of the budget to get started. Because the debt bubble is the great burden. It's a, debt, it's a burden to all of us. And as I mentioned earlier, these programs are going to go down if we don't get our budget under control. And we have to be willing to look at overseas spending and all of the entitlement system here in this country.